Wonderful to have you here. Today what I want to do is discuss finding good fortune in early Buddhism. It's a new book that I have coming out about a poem from early Buddhism. But before I get to all that, if, if you're new to this channel and interested in living a wiser and a kinder and a calmer life, consider subscribing to this channel and click the bell down below if you want to receive notifications when I come out with new videos. So this story about finding good fortune, well, it begins, at least this part of it, in uh, 2017, I believe it was in April, when uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi, the eminent uh, uh, Theravada translator and scholar. He translated many of the uh, suttas from Pali into English. He's probably the most famous translator in English. He gave a retreat at New York Insight, a weekend-long retreat, so it was Friday night plus Saturday and Sunday, uh, discussing a, one particular poem from the early tradition. It's a poem that he had recently translated himself in his book on the Sutta Nipata, which I have back on my bookshelf, and I'll leave a link to down below in the notes in case you want to see it. It's a poem in 12 stanzas, so it's a short poem, and yet we spent basically what amounted to about two and a half days, it seems, of time looking at it. This is a poem, uh, it's called The Great Sutta on Good Fortune, and it's one that is read in many uh, South Asian Buddhist countries, read and studied and memorized by school children. It's a normal kind of poem to get to know, although I think very few people know it in the West. This weekend was an extraordinary experience uh, for me. It, among other things, it allowed me to meet Bhikkhu Bodhi uh, for the first time uh, and get to talk with him. He had been always an inspiration to me, uh, although my own uh, practice is secular, as some of you will know, and I made clear to him as well, uh, he, his, his work in divulging, in, in translating and discussing the work of early Buddhism uh, really laid the foundation for my own knowledge of early Buddhism. Although I had read, of course, quite a bit, it helped to have a deep study of each of the suttas individually, and Bhikkhu Bodhi over the years has produced an enormous amount of information about the suttas, discussions, talks. I'll leave links to uh, one or two of those uh, groups of talks down below in the notes in case you want to know, but in any event, he has done a lot of work in this area uh, which he's given to the public and which we can learn from. And it's that work of his that allowed me to write a number of papers which I had published and which I presented to uh, uh, Bhante Bodhi. Bhante is a, an honorific, Bhante Bodhi. And he uh, read them and uh, enjoyed them. Uh, again, we had a discussion, and then that was sort of the end of it. However, several years later, uh, I began to think about this weekend-long retreat, and it occurred to me that this, the, the material, the, the poem from this retreat, would make a wonderful book. Uh, it, it deserved to have a wider audience, and so I decided to try to write down uh, what he had gotten across to us, at least my recollection of it, and of course my own interpretations of things. I mean, I have my own take on, on a lot of it, but uh, so what this eventually resulted in was a book. And before releasing this book, which I am now about to do, or I should say by the time this video is out, I will have done, uh, I wanted to get uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi's uh, uh, ideas. In other words, I wanted to send him a copy of the book so that he could look at it, because I wanted to make sure I hadn't ma made any major errors. I wanted to make sure that I wasn't overstepping my boundaries in any respect with, uh, with material, after all, that he had presented to, to a lot of people, including myself. And so I, I, I sent him a copy of the book, and uh, he was very, very generous to read it, to comment on it, in other words, to give me a bunch of uh, edits, corrections that I should do, which I've done, and also to offer to write a foreword to the book, which was uh, very humbling and a wonderful uh, addition, I think, to the book as well, because not only now do you have my own take, but you have a foreword by Bhikkhu Bodhi about the poem and its importance as he sees it. It was a wonderfully kind gesture on his part, and indeed very fortunate uh, for me, I think, for the book. 
And on the, on the subject of fortune, that is, after all, the topic of this poem, is, is how do we gain good fortune? How do we gain good results in our lives? And this is, of course, a, a topic for, for humanity from time immemorial. People wondering how it is that they could gain good fortune in their lives. And the same thing was true in the Buddha's lifetime. And indeed, uh, typically in early cultures, uh, one looked for good fortune through omens, through looking at uh, potential results from nature, from the gods, who were going to tell us, give us omens, give us a portents and signs about what, were, uh, what, would, what might be good fortune or not. Another way we would potentially do it in, in early cultures is to do sacrifices to the gods, to propitiate them in some way, to present them with prayer or with other objects of value that would make the gods more likely to intercede on our behalf and provide us with the good fortune that we're looking for. That, after all, was the aim of, for example, the, the Vedas, which were the oldest religious texts in India, and uh, discussed a number of ways of sacrifices that one could make to the gods and different kinds of prayers and so on that one could make. And so it's within that context, within that world, that the Buddha comes up with this poem. And the Buddha's answer to how we could gain good fortune really turns this whole picture I've just given on its head. Instead of making a sacrifice or propitiation to the gods, instead of looking for portents in the outside world, instead the gods came to the Buddha. The gods themselves didn't know where to gain good fortune. And they realized that the Buddha was the person who knew about wisdom, and so he was the person to go to to try to find an answer to this question about good fortune, because after all, the gods themselves want good fortune. And so they came to the Buddha and asked the Buddha, that's the beginning of the poem, how do we gain good fortune? And the poem that results is, I think, arguably the most comprehensive map of Buddhist practice in all of early Buddhism. It includes a lot of material that is, uh, that is important for lay practitioners, that is to say, people who are not monastics. It even includes a lot of material that we might say is relevant to people who aren't even Buddhist. Just normal people who are in the world could get a lot of inspiration from this poem or ideas, wise practices, simply from these ideas of the Buddha. Uh, just to take a couple of examples, there are a number of different maps of practice in early Buddhism. Uh, perhaps the most famous is the Eightfold Path. Uh, another one is what's called the Gradual Training. And this poem provides a path that is significantly broader and more detailed than either of those. Bhikkhu Bodhi calls this poem a comprehensive ground plan for the good life. It includes 38 steps, 38 different practices that we can undertake that will help us in a sort of a more or less linear fashion to gain uh, wisdom, to gain uh, a, a, a fortune until we get all the way to the highest end, which is attaining enlightenment or awakening. Uh, now, now, this is more or less linear, of course. There's going to be lots of back and forth. It's, of course, much more complicated than that. It's not very simple. But the basic idea is we begin from a stage of where we really don't know anything, and we work our way forward. And most of the steps along the path given in these 38 steps are practices that are relevant directly to lay people, to a lay audience. Uh, in many of the other paths, in particular, let's say the, the gradual training, which is a very famous early Buddhist map of practice, the gradual training is almost exclusively intended for monastics. The gradual training begins, uh, well, it begins with the arising of a Buddha in the world, but almost immediately it turns to a person who decides to join the monastery, join the monastic order. And at that point, really, the, the path begins in earnest. 
Whereas this poem uh, describes quite a different sort of path, where much of what we are supposed to do is stuff that, that entails uh, family obligations, obligations to uh, friends, obligations to spouses, that sort of thing that, that, uh, d that are, are relevant really for lay people more than they are for monastics. And that's why I think this poem is so important and really should be better known than it is. Now, the Eightfold Path as well is a wonderful path of practice, but it's very schematic. That is to say, it's, it's, it only has eight different uh, steps in it, although they can, of course, be broken down further, but, but at least on its surface, it's only eight steps. Very, very schematic, and it involves a lot of interpretation as to what these steps entail and how we can actually make use of them in our lives. Uh, whereas these 38 st stages in this poem uh, are, are, I think, a little bit more obvious to us, although each of them will require unpacking. Now, in this video, I'm not going to go into all 38. That would be way too long. Um, I should say I've done videos also, of course, about the Eightfold Path, about the gradual training. Uh, but in this video, all that I want, what I want to do is to uh, sketch out the beginning of the path at the very least. And if you want to read more about it, uh, of course, my book is uh, available. Uh, I also leave a link to a recent translation of the poem by uh, Bhikkhu Brahmali, another uh, monastic, uh, which is available online so that you can see it. It's a very good translation. It's similar to Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, which is kind of the one that uh, is the one that I more or less use in the book. So this poem begins in a very down-to-earth way. It, it tells us that one of the roots for obtaining good fortune is to surround ourselves with the right sorts of people. And this is the sort of thing that when we enter the poem, we should expect we're not even expected to be uh, followers of the Buddha or any of the Buddha's ideas. We're not supposed to be even, maybe even adults. We may even be children. And the point is that we are thrown into a context of life where what's going to have the most effect upon us directly are the people we surround ourselves with. And so that is the place to start, that we surround, that, that the great source of good fortune, the first of these 38 stages, the first step, is surrounding ourselves with the right sorts of people. Now, Many of us will know that we don't necessarily have a choice in who we're thrown in with. Uh, certainly when we're born, we don't have a choice. And so, although this is a very uh, simple uh, practice, it's not necessarily easy to, uh, uh, to realize. Uh, we may have to indeed work long and hard to get ourselves out of certain situations with certain people that we don't feel are right for us and into other situations. But simply knowing the problem can give us some insight into what we need to do. Because if we don't know what we need to do to begin, it's hard to go in the right direction. Now, I think you'll see this isn't esoteric advice of any kind. It's really down to earth. It's the kind of thing that really will make the most difference to us on a day-to-day -day basis, is knowing to whom to turn, or at least knowing the sort of person to whom we should turn for advice on where to go with our lives. Now, although this poem has 38 steps, so in that sense it's relatively lengthy, each of these steps is very compact, only perhaps a word or two about what we're supposed to do. So it's very easy to read through the poem quickly, as I think you can if you go to the link I've provided, and sort of look at it quickly and move on to other things. That unfortunately would not get us very far, it wouldn't get us very deep. What I think really needs to be done is to focus individually on each of these stages, to think about what it really implies for us in our lives, such as this first step I've simply, uh, I've just begun talking about. And so what Bhikkhu Bodhi did in his weekend retreat is to go through each step individually and then talk about the various parts of the suttas that that uh, spoke to that particular claim, that particular practice. 
because each of these stages, each of these 38 stages, really is implicitly referencing all kinds of material from the suttas that tell us what we need to do. And so that's what I've tried to capture in this book, is some of the flavor of the suttas, what the suttas are trying to say about each of these points, as well as some of my own ideas, my own interpretations, my own thoughts about where each of these 38 steps should take us in our lives. So take a look, take a look at the book. If you're interested, I'll leave, of course, links to how to find a copy of this book, which is out now. And I hope that you find it interesting. Now, if you're interested also in other kinds of early maps of the Buddhist path, I have an earlier video about the gradual training that I discussed uh, just a minute ago. And I'll leave a link to that video up here on the screen. Uh, thanks to my patrons over on Patreon. Without you, this would not be possible. If you want to join us, uh, please take a look over my Patreon page as well. Thanks so much, and we'll catch you on the next one. And meanwhile, all of you be well.